And last thing I would say is we need to put resources into interrogations. If you go to almost any, I went to three different, uh, four different locations in Iraq where we interrogated, and every single one was the same. The interrogation booths were merely four by uh, four walled rooms made of plywood with cheap plastic chairs that would barely support your weight. In most cases, you could hear through the walls the interrogation that was going on next to you. And we'll spend a million dollars to give soldiers the right weapons to go out and kill people, but we can't find them because we won't spend the resources to get the information that would lead them to the target. We should put in a place of uh, certain incentives, recruitment bonuses, for instance, that would retain and recruit the best possible people from which to mold interrogators. Instead, they just recently lowered the standard of testing to enter the career field of interrogations. And we should give senior interrogators, those people who supervise interrogators, the power and ability to apply real incentives. The best I could give somebody in Iraq was a pillow or a blanket. We should give them the funds to be able to prevent, uh, present real incentives to, to convince people to cooperate. Can we learn something from the Indonesians in our last area, which is research? What are other countries doing with interrogation methods or analysis of, in, of t detainees and terrorists that we're not doing? I present this figure, uh, which is, <laughs> I think you're right, the, the model of dealing uh, with Islamic extremists when interrogating them from the Indonesians, which is a medical model. Study the target, diagnose level of difficulty, and then use therapy. <laughs> Maybe that's a doctor getting called. Um, we do, we preach something similar in our training, which is to analyze the detainee, but we don't go into details about how do you analyze that person. Uh, next, is this, is this flip the slide, this one? Yeah. Look at the Indonesian model. They assess the level of radicalism. This is something I never saw I was exposed to in, in our training. Both what is their motive and what is their role in the network. It's an excellent model for crafting an approach strategy by analyzing detainee, not based on stereotypes, but based on each individual and why they joined a, a violent group. And then look at this last model that they use. It's very specific. It addresses all the different reasons somebody may have joined and what role they have. I especially like this one down here, which in my experience was the most important personal problems. Most people I found in Iraq, uh, I, I can tell you, I never met, met the diehard jihadist who had joined out of ideology. Maybe one, a 12-year-old boy uh, who had been brainwashed by his father. I met a lot of people who had joined al-Qaeda because they needed protection from Shia militias and reprisal killings. People who had joined because they were worried about Sunni's access to oil wealth in the future. And a lot of reasons but none of them were religious-based. And that's not to say that there aren't hardcore jihadist members of al-Qaeda who did join for ideology. But I'd also argue that they're the easiest to interrogate because they're the most emotional. Interrogators are an underutilized weapon in countering violent extremism. We're used to gather tactical intelligence, stop the next terrorist attack. In comparison, Indonesia has turned interrogations into a strategic weapon. Not about stopping terrorist attacks, although they'll do that if they get that information, but into stopping the recruitment of future terrorists by turning detainees into advocates against violence. And they've done this successfully uh, with numerous mid and high level uh, Jamia Islamia leaders. We should learn from their experience. But to do that, we have to put the right resources the right training, uh, and the right research into interrogations. We have to quit seeing interrogations as a skill and see interrogators as a profession. We have no professional organization of interrogators. There's no American Bar Association, or American Medical Association for interrogators. Why can't we get those resources when everybody argues that this is a very important weapon in this conflict? You know, Norden Muhammad Top was found and killed by interrogation. Saddam Hussein was found through interrogations. And Zarqawi was killed through interrogations. We have numerous success successes to prove our worth, but we can't get the resources. Is it because we don't build anything? We don't have the lobbying muscle to produce jobs? I'm not sure, but I think it's uh, an issue that needs to be addressed. I am completely confident that if we give 
interrogators the right resources and train them properly, they will win the battle of wits and that they will return exponentially on the dividends that we pay to them, not in just stopping terrorist attacks, but in choking off the terrorist lifeblood, which is new recruits. Thank you. Great. Um, well, we're going to throw it open to questions. Uh, you've got to wait for the microphone because we have a C-SPAN camera here. Um, you also have to identify yourself and your affiliation and encourage questions, not statements. Um, but let me, uh, as the uh, chair here, take a, a prerogative to ask Matthew a question, which is, you know, the Indonesian model is very interesting. Clearly, they've had great success in sort of turning people in Jamaa Islamia to become advocates of de-radicalization, you know, de et cetera. But I mean, in terms of applying these models to the West, it seems to be pretty difficult because you know, a, a Western policeman or you know, some of the equivalent of the Indonesian Detachment 88, they don't know enough about Islam really to, I mean, they, they may be reasonably well educated about Islam, but it's half of them, they don't have the sort of tactile understanding of the environment. and. Um, I mean, what what are the lessons that can be applied in the West, or is it, is it more that this is very interesting, these guys are doing something that is quite successful, but it doesn't really have much applicability to a Western police effort? Uh, well, one of the things I discovered in Iraq is that, uh, first of all, and, and this is well known by interrogators, is that even radical Muslims typically consider uh, Christians people of the book. Uh, and, even, and, and even Jews to be people of the book. Uh, and so there is a fundamental level of uh, respect as long as you respect their religion. You know, I've been asked a lot, kind of in a similar note, uh, can females be good interrogators, especially against highly radical or ideological detainees? And my answer is yes. It's not about the fact that she's a female. It's about how she respects uh, the religion and culture of the detainee. And we had several female interrogators who were very successful in Iraq. That doesn't mean the 100% is going to work. Um, I think there are some difficulties because we're Western, because of the way that we think about things. Um, you know, there's all types of research that's been done on cultural differences. Uh, you know, one very basic one is that people talk about is that uh, Westerners tend to be very chronological. When we ask somebody, you know, about an event, we typically want to hear about it in terms of time, but in the Middle East, those uh, events are usually described in terms of relationships. Uh, and those types of things, that's why I say we can do this just as well as the Indonesians, even though we're not Muslims, but we have to have cultural acumen, not cultural knowledge. Uh, it has to go beyond just being able to recite facts. Uh, and you know, the Indonesians do have some inherent advantages. You know, the, the Colonel, now General, uh, Tito Canarvian, who's the head of Attachment 88 and who ran the interrogations and explained to me these methods, uh, he told me their interrogators will pray with their detainees before the interrogation. Uh, it's a great way to show respect and, and to emphasize the common bonds. Uh, I'll tell you one of the methods that I use to bridge that gap actually comes from sports psychology. You know, the practice of an athlete uh, rehearsing in his mind making a basket before he goes out to the court. Uh, I would use this technique called the Van Gogh technique, uh, which is Van Gogh in, in terms of the painter. Uh, I would paint a picture in the mind of the detainee using words of us cooperating and what the benefits of that would be. Uh, I would tell them to close their eyes and imagine in Iraq where my family visits to come see Babylon at some time in the future, which is now the Disneyland of Iraq. Uh, and his son and my son are walking down the street hand in hand without fear of violence. Uh, I can tell you, uh, images like that uh, often move detainees to tears uh, because they, it was such an emotional pull to them to think about an Iraq that could be secure and that we could get there by cooperating because they came in in the interrogation booth with a lot of stereotypes about us, especially after having seen the pictures of Abu Ghraib and knowing what, what happened at uh, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, 